Hey, game-changing prayers. Ah, oh, some prayers in the Bible. There are some. I'm so thankful that God led people to pray and then he also led them to write down their prayers. So they're recorded in the Old Testament and New Testament. And we want to focus on some New Testament prayers that are recorded for this month. And when the preaching, teaching team were considering uh, those prayers, I said, ah, I bars the two prayers in Ephesians. Can I do it? Can I do it? Can I do it? Because they've been life-changing prayers for me. Um, the two prayers that Paul puts in writing to the Ephesian Christians um, have helped me no end over the years. And um, particularly when I started grasping what he was saying and then I started experiencing what he was praying for. And, um, and Paul's prayers in Ephesians 1, verse 15 to 20, 23 and Ephesians 3. I hope to do Ephesians 3 at the end of, of uh, the month when we take up our, our special support offering on that day. But uh, when you read Ephesians, particularly the first chapter, it kind of blows you away. But in verses 1 through to 14, and you read it this week, in fact, that sentence, in the 14 verses, or verses 3 to 14, Paul gets so excited about what he is writing that he doesn't even put full stops or commas or semicolons or and. It's just like, brrrr. it's a longer sentence in the Bible. And, and it's like, it, it concepts flow one on top of the other as he talks about Jesus and what he did and what he accomplished through his life, death and resurrection and ongoing ministry for you and me. And how he says, now you're adopted, you're called, you're adopted. The spirits come to live within you. You have a new status, you're secure, you're called, you're predestined, you're loved before the foundation of the world. You've been forgiven, you've been transformed. He kind of lists all the privileges, all the privileges and the benefits and the blessings that are now ours when you get connected to Jesus Christ. And so when you receive Jesus as your saviour, you've got no idea what you're getting yourself in for. Usually people will receive Christ and because they have a need or there's a circumstance that's going down, but they really don't understand fully they're being caught up in God's amazing plan for the ages and how God saw you before you were even a, a little glitter in your daddy's eye. In fact, he knew you before this world was even created. And so Paul talks about this in, in verses um, uh, 3 to 14. Amazing. The promises, the privileges that are ours now as adopted children of God, as new creations because of his grace. But then he kind of stops and says, okay, okay, okay. It's like you, you get him saying, this is too much. It's like, it, this is too much revelation. This is like, do they really get it? Do you think, he's probably asking himself, do, do, are those Ephesian Christians who I love, are they really going to get it? And he kind of thinks, he pauses and he says, God, and he starts praying, God, I pray for them. And he does this amazing prayer that God supernaturally, by the Holy Spirit, will give them wisdom, revelation, enlighten their hearts that they would know what he's talking about. Because he's, he, he's actually realizing if they don't know this, the foundation in their life is going, is going to be shaken. Because this is the only way to get a solid grace, gospel grace foundation. If you know these things, no matter what comes your way, you're going to survive, you're going to flourish, you're going to prosper. And that's why he spends uh, verses 15 to 23 on, on this prayer. For them to realise, to experience, to really know the promises that he talks about in the first few verses. So let's read this prayer, hey, before I go too much further. I could speak for hours on this, but I've only got a few minutes. For this reason, this is Paul, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, isn't that interesting? Their faith in Jesus and their love for God's people. Because I haven't stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Oh, I feel the same way. When I think about you, 40 years serving the Lord together, those who have gone before, those who are here, it just helps. I just thank God, I just thank you for their faith in Jesus. The vertical, it's like the cross. Vertical, connection with God. The horizontal is relationships with people. 
Faith in God shows itself in loving relationships with people. People who say they're connected with God but hate one another, they're not Christians. They can't be. So he's saying here, I thank God for you. I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus, vertical, and your love for all of God's people, I haven't stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And I tell you that I feel the same way about you and all those who belong to the Christian Family Centre, both here and in all of our church sites. Then he goes, I keep asking. So he goes, I, I haven't stopped giving thanks and now I keep asking. That God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Get this. Know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you've been called. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Man, that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. That power's in you. Far above all devil's powers, all human powers. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. That resurrection power, that divine energy that raised the dead body of Jesus, that power is in you. That's what he's saying. That power is in you. So we're devil defeaters. And get this, and God placed all things under his feet, Jesus, and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. He is the head of the church and head over everything for the church, for our benefit, which is his body. We, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Wow. I just want to list those down for you. I want to list these down. To know him. He says that, that your wisdom and revelation will really enlighten our hearts, Lord. That's, that's what he's saying. saying Lord, he's saying, Lord, enlighten their hearts that they will really know these five things about Jesus. Let's put the five things up, guys. To know Jesus better. To know Jesus' hope-filled calling. To know Jesus' rich inheritance. To know Jesus' great power. To know Jesus' victorious church. Amazing. Look at these things. You can read this yourself. See, he talks about it in verses 3 to 4. And now he prays. He goes, oh, that they would know him better. They would know the hope to which they've been called. The rich inheritance that's now at theirs. Forgiveness, grace, adoption. They would know his great power and they would know Jesus' victorious church. And uh, I have five little phrases that kind of I've coined over the years that um, are like a coat hanger for me. That You can take that off, guys. That, that really open this area up. Because I need a coat hanger. Well, you need coat hangers. You, you, some of you have got lots of them at home because you've got lots of clothes. So otherwise, you imagine if if all your clothes were just thrown in a mess, or maybe they are. <laughs> and what a job on a Sunday. Oh, what am I going to wear? Where's that sock, Kathy? Where's those undies? Oh, they're in that pile there. Vroom, and another pile there. You, imagine, you know when you lose a sock? And you don't know whether they're in the underpants pile or they're in the shirt? Oh, I mean, it's a disaster. So at home, my wardrobe is ordered. Beautiful coat hangers there for the jackets, for the pants. There's a drawer there for the undies, for socks, different colour socks. Oh man, I've only got a minute to get out. I can't spend 10 minutes trying to find that odd sock. You know, like coat hangers help you to order what you're going to wear. So it's easy to put on clothes and to go. So I need little statements that are coat hangers for me to help me to understand the concepts of what Paul is talking about here. And there are five phrases that succinctly express the essence of the new creation grace message. As I said, they're coat hangers. Uh, I've just finished a 100-page manuscript that uh, Cass uh, uh, Peters just typed up, and she just loves it. She's typed it up, and she keeps editing it. And, and it's 100. We hope to do it as a book. I feel so 
encouraged by it because I know that if people don't understand the gospel and grace message of their identity in him, they'll never really grow properly and be effective in their Christian their life and ministry. So I've tried to put it down in six chapters and, uh, and Milan hopes to publish it sometime, somewhere, once a few editors have a look at it and change everything. You know, it's like, for me, and I'll give you these five things in a minute. I'm just setting you up so you buy my book. <laughs> don't know, I, look, I'd give it away. I don't care how much we sell it for. $2, $5, $10, whatever. But I, I want to give them away overseas to the third world countries, to developing countries. But um, for me, um, in the early years of my Christian experience, I found a, a dissonance between what God said that I am in Christ and what he has done for me and my actual experience. Okay? And I found that endeavouring to live the Christian life, I was kept on failing, I kept on falling over and didn't, the statements of the word were so powerful and I, and I, was, I agreed with them. And I used to cry out to God, say, God, I, this is kind of not working for me. This is in the early years. And I had issues and problems and that, that just thought, okay, it's not actually... So I would tell him, something, God, this is not quite working. So I'd sin again. I'd say, well, I'm, 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 I know forgiveness would come. There's no question. But I'm saying, I don't want to sin. I love you. I need power to overcome my sin nature. I need your resources. How is this going to work? And so I went through a, an incredible searching and reading and reflecting and praying time. And certain books, and in, in this book that I've written, I've listed the books that really helped me in those early years. Some of them are really old and, and uh, the, the language is probably a bit outdated, but they helped me enormously. And I remember it was like when the revelation came, when the revelation came, like, like Paul's praying, I pray that God will give you a spirit of wisdom and insight. It was almost like I found myself crying out to God and he answering back, because I'm striving to try and experience what he says should be my experience. And it's like God said, Bill, 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 why are you striving and trying to get into a room you're already in? Let me in, let me in, let me in, I need it, I need it. And he's saying, you're already in. Why are you banging on doors and striving in your own strength? I've done it, son. I've done it for you. And then I realized the word done was like a swear word to me because I love doing. I'm a doer, an activist person. So I, I think it's, it's too easy. It can't be all done. Surely I've got to do a whole pile of stuff. God's saying, son, it's done for you. Stop your doing. And then trying to reform my life. I've got to change this and change that. He says, no, 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 no. You can't change your heart. You can't change the orientation of your sin nature. You've got to see it dead. So therefore, I've got to give you a new life, an exchange life. Stop trying to reform the old Bill Vasilakis. See him dead in Christ, buried in baptism, and resurrected to new life. And now it's an exchange life. The life of God now comes within you to help you to live that life. So just those two phrases, it's done. And it's an exchange life. I'm not trying to reform something that's totally corrupt, something that's totally sinful, something that you can't change human nature by self-effort or by a re-education program. It takes the power of God through the Holy Spirit reprogramming us through his promises that he gives to us, like verses 4, 3 to 14 of Ephesians 1. And so it, it was transformative for me. So in this book, I try and share my, my journey of what happened there. So that, because I was just talking still to a lot of pastors, a lot of, I was talking to a pastor the other day who goes to the Sudan and to other places in Africa. He says, Bill, they don't know the gospel. They don't know the grace message. It's a whole pile of religion. And they, they're sincere, but they keep falling over. They keep going back to the old. He goes, I need a book. I need a book that just explains it. Not a heavy theological tome of 600 pages. And I just said to him, you know what? I'm just almost finished it. It's 98 pages. And he goes, give it to me. I said, well, it's not finished yet. My wife's got to edit it and she's going to cut this and cut that out and there's a couple of others are going to do it as well. No, no, I'm just teasing. 
So what are these five statements? Memorise them. I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. I'm fully identified in his life and his death. What he did on the cross was not for himself, it was for me. So I am blessed through his death on the cross on my behalf. And his victory is my victory. He did it for me. It's like you can't change history. This has happened. This has actually happened. Jesus came and died on a cross. And the benefits of his death are for us. It's a legal, historical fact. And yet our brains find it hard to, 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 to conceive because it's a concept sitting with him in heavenly places. What does that mean in Ephesians 2? I'm now seated with him in heavenly places. He's seated at the Father's right hand. He's basically saying all the authority that the Father gave Jesus is now yours. And you can view life from the heavenly realms looking down from a position, not standing, but sitting, resting in the finished work. But it's a concept. It's hard for people to get it unless the Holy Spirit impregnates them on the inside where they see it. And through the grafting of God's word on the inside. Secondly, Christ is in me. Because it's not just a cognitive faith where it's all intellectual that I've got to understand 20 propositions. But the the risen Christ, he rose from the dead. He went back to heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit. He's now going to come and live in your bodies. So it's an experiential faith, not just a cognitive faith. It's being reborn of the Spirit on the inside. It's being baptised in the Holy Spirit. Like last Sunday, we had a whole stack of people baptised in the Holy Spirit and being able to worship God in a brand new prayer language. And so that brings you up close and personal with God. It's not just a philosophical faith, a propositional faith. I believe these three, four things. You can believe with your head and your heart can be far removed. This is a transformative experience. Christ comes to live in me permanently and now I feel totally secure and safe because he lives within me and he will never leave or never leave me or forsake me so I'm in Christ death of Christ Christ is in me through his resurrection this is so basic it's easy to miss it but I tell you when you're going through hell And the devils are yelling in your ear to try and turn you away. Or there are difficult people that you're having to deal with or you're facing circumstances to know that you're in Christ. And that's been done for you. And to know that Christ is now in you, I tell you, it secures you. It helps you no end, amazingly. Thirdly, Christ is working through me. Even when my senses tell me that God's a million miles away. And there are times when my senses tell me God's a million miles away. I don't feel his presence. I don't feel he's with me. Hey, but some days I wake up and I don't feel like loving my wife. I don't feel like being nice to my kids because they've been horrible to me. You understand? See, if I live by my feelings, I'm going, to be all, I'm going to be manipulated by my moods. And that's a very unstable situation, to be manipulated by your moods. My, look, my moods can change if I eat a pizza the night before. The next morning, I'm a different person. You get something stuck in your guts for a few hours, it doesn't move, and I mean, it really upsets you. You don't feel like being warm and nice to anyone. So if your faith is based on your feelings, you're going to be manipulated by your moods and you're going to go all over the place. You believe in God, you won't believe in God. Hey, Christ is working through you even when you don't feel like he's close to you. Even in my toughest times when I felt like quitting as the pastor of the Christian Family Centre, never felt like quitting against Jesus, during those times it seemed like God was using me more powerfully than in the times when I didn't want to quit. What? How do you get that? I feel like death warmed up. I don't want to come to church. Yeah, even me. I'm the pastor. It's like, and yet it seemed that God was working through me. And I'm thinking, God, why would you use a miserable wretch like me? And he says, precisely. (laughs) 
Get out of the way, Bill. Don't rely on your own self. I'm in you. You're in Christ. Christ is, Christ is in you, and I'm working through you in spite of you. Oh, wow, isn't that amazing? That's my story. That he equips us with supernatural equipment, gifts, to be effective and fruitful as I serve him, even when I'm just gritting my teeth and just keep turning up. And someone once said, just keep turning up is the key to success. Just keep turning up. Just keep turning up and, and, and just keep doing it. And so sometimes you've got to faith it till you make it. For some of you that are, that are married and you're going through a really tough time, sometimes you've got to just f- not fake it till you make it. You've got to faith it till you make it. By faith, love her. By faith, do an act of kindness towards him. You don't feel like it. Just do it. An act of your will. Faith it. Faith it. And as you, you don't feel like it. But as you act kindly, as you act considerately, as you act nicely, you know what's going to happen? It's going to come back and hit you. What you sow is going to come back and knock you over. But you sow the opposite, it's going to come back and knock you over too. See, it's by faith. And then the feelings return. And we all want the feelings every day. Oh, give me that hug and kiss. And oh, you know, lovey, dovey, dovey, dovey. We want that every day, don't we? Does, everyone, does anyone get that every day? Is there anyone, any human being here that's never had a fight with their wife or their spouse and, and they feel absolutely rapturously in love from the day that you walk down the aisle? Is there any human being like that? David Hersey, put your hand down. You know what I'm saying? You've got a relationship with Jesus. You're in Christ. He's in you. And he's working through you. Hey, look, Christ has overcome, the fourth one, Satan for me. I don't have to try and fight the devil in my own strength. Jesus has conquered sin, sickness, death, and all demonic powers for me through his death, resurrection, and continuing ministry in heaven. What do you think he's doing in heaven now? He's not twiddling his thumbs saying, oh, when am I going to come back? He is working. Saving people, healing people, delivering people, setting people free, ruling in our world through the Holy Spirit and through his church. Satan's not going to win. We've read the book of Revelation. We know the end of the story. He's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. He's a defeated foe through the cross. And we now enforce his defeat with resurrection power, living within us, armed with his word. And finally, Christ has a victorious church, a victorious body. I'm a member, you're a member of this living body. It's his beautiful bride, his church. And his church is a reflection of his glory and grace and power. And it expresses the fullness of Christ and the victory of Christ. Hey, the church has been around from the day of Pentecost. Nations have come and gone. Civilizations have come and gone, but the church of Jesus Christ is growing from strength to strength. It's indestructible. It's the largest living organization on planet Earth. Nothing comes close to it. And nothing comes close to its power to do good. The salting and the enlightenment that it brings to our world. Don't listen to the media that talk about the sins of the church. Man, politicians sin. Teachers sin, doctors sin, churches, individual members sin. We don't throw out the whole education system because you've got a bunch of teachers that are, need to be sacked. You don't. Same thing applies in the political sense. Same as with the church. If a minister or people say they're Christians and do horrible stuff and abuse kids, kick them out and put them in jail. There's no, that's just the right thing to do, isn't it? But the church of Jesus Christ, you know, there's one denomination in Australia that has more social workers than all the governments put together. Just one denomination. That's not even the Salvation Army. You just think of the social workers, the caregivers, the elderly care, homes, kids, schools, hospitals. There isn't enough money in the federal and state budgets for the next hundred years to be able to do the services that the church of Jesus Christ, his living body, is doing here in Australia right now. And then the millions of dollars that are raised overseas for for mission and supporting humanitarian ventures. 
I mean, it's predominantly the church people that give to that. So don't be conned by, this is a victorious church. This is a, a living, beautiful bride that we belong to. And the Christian Family Centre for 40 years. Wow, how Jesus has won through time and time again victories and meeting all of our needs and defeating and forcing the devil's defeat. Folks, these five little coat hangers, you want to say them with me? I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. Christ is working through me. Christ has overcome Satan for me. Christ has a victorious body, his church. That's what Paul prays, that you really get it. It's a game-changing prayer. It's all been done for you by Jesus. It's being done for you by Jesus in the present. It will be done for you by Jesus in the future. Past, present and future. It's been done, it's being done, and it will be done. This is the new creation grace message. If you get it, and it'll lay a foundation in your life that'll be immovable. Nobody will be able to move you. No devil that comes against you will survive you. You just look them in the eye and say, get lost in Jesus' name. Not going your way. No sin from your own nature or the temptation will win if you understand this. You're able then to say, you know what? Yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm now a saint. I was a sinner, I'm now I'm a saint. I'm an adopted son of God. And once I was enslaved by my sin nature, now I'm free from its addictive power. I have the life of the Holy Spirit within me and I can overcome the old habit patterns of, of the old Adamic nature in Adam. We're now in Christ. It's a game-changing prayer for you. Make it your own.